please also welcome Ms. Fiona Butter. Describe the historical background and sensitivities of the Jammu and Kashmir conflict in the region of South Asia, I'll further deliberate upon the current escalation of tensions between India and Pakistan, alongside with Pakistan's financial dealings with China, which risk to put the country into a colossal debt trap due to Beijing's debt trap diplomacy. I will first start with examining the terrorist attack in Pulwama in Indian administered Jammu and Kashmir, which took place on the 14th of February and killed more than 40 personnel of the paramilitary Central Reserve Police Force. This barbaric act of aggression not only exposed Pakistan's willingness to protect terrorists on its soil, but in addition, almost brought the two countries to the brink of war. The recent escalation shows how fragile peace in South Asia is. The string of terrorist attacks launched in, these, uh, in recent years by terrorist outfits Lashkar e Taiba and Jaish e Mohammed, which are sheltered on Pakistani territory by the Pakistani military establishment, has inflamed passions and indignation in India. Following the Mumbai terrorist attacks carried out by Lashkar e Taiba in 2008 and the Patan Khot and Yuri attacks by Jaish e Mohammed in January and September 2016, respectively, public opinion in India had progressively reached a tipping point. This has put the Indian government under acute pressure to shed the restraint exercised by it so far and respond more forcefully than it has done in the past to continuous Pakistani provocations through its terrorist proxies. Therefore, the military response that had been anticipated as part of India's comprehensive strategy to address Pakistan's sponsored terrorism directed against India took the form of preemptive counterterrorism airstrikes in the early hours of the 26th of February that targeted a major Jaish e Mohammed terrorist camp in Balakot situated in the Pakistani province of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. Pakistan, after initially denying that any such incident had occurred, subsequently acknowledged reluctantly that Indian fighter aircraft had indeed penetrated deep into Pakistani territory undetected and had dropped bombs near Balakot. Pakistan's botched attempt at retaliation for an airstrike targeting Indian military installations on the morning of the 27th of February were repulsed by the Indian Air Force near the line of control that separates the two countries across a major part of Jammu and Kashmir. The Indian Air Force shot down a Pakistani F-16 fighter, but also lost one of its MiG-21 fighters, whose pilot drifted across the LOC and was picked up by Pakistani forces there. Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan subsequently appealed to India for de-escalation and under pressure from the United States announced on the 28th of February that Pakistan would return the pilot to India on the 1st of March as a so-called peace gesture. Nevertheless, he did not articulate any commitment to clamp down demonstratively on the terrorist proxies of the Pakistani military establishment. Amidst calls for de-escalation of tensions, the international community stressed on Pakistan that it must deny sale heaven to terrorist outfits operating from its soil. The diplomatic cloud that Pakistan had once enjoyed in the heyday of the Cold War has now eroded as the country's true calling has become increasingly apparent and its relationship with the US has turned into one of mutual suspicion. Pakistan was powerful enough in the 1975 to defeat a much larger India to secure a non-permanent seat at the United Nations Security Council. The country standing thereafter went so far downhill that it barely managed to scrape through in 2011 when it contested against a much weaker Kyrgyzstan. Pakistan's sponsorship of and support of terrorists has been a major factor that has contributed to the country's slight. It was no surprise, therefore, that countries such as the US, the UK, France, Australia, and Japan, among others, called for Pakistan to act against the terrorist groups it was harboring. 
The US, UK and France once again asked the UN Security Council Sanctions Committee to subject Jaish Mohammed leader Masoud Azhar to an arms embargo, global travel ban, and asset freeze. Such urgent callings not only placed Pakistan in an unenviable position, but also exposed the mischief behind the repeated Chinese blocking over the last 10 years of the listing of Masoud Azhar as a global terrorist at the UN Security Council Resolution 1267 Sanctions Committee. Even after the Pulwama attack, China consciously chose not to mention the Jaish e Mohammed in its reaction, despite the outfit having unambiguously claimed responsibility for the attack. Opinion among experts on the direction the tensions between India and Pakistan will now take is divided. India has described Pakistan's 27th of February air attack as an act of aggression. It has also made it clear that only immediate and verifiable action by Pakistan against terrorists and terror groups operating from territories under its control will be warranted. The core message to Pakistan was that India was willing and capable of acting against anti-India terrorist groups harbored by Pakistan, and while it was not inclined to provoke the Pakistani military, it was now seriously intent on protecting itself no matter what the potential response from Pakistan would be. Whichever turn the current situation takes, one fact on which there is little ambiguity is that India has definitely changed the rules of the game as far as its response to Pakistani backed terrorism is concerned. Pakistan's calculation that a low cost asymmetrical war fought by terrorist proxies would keep India tied down and its assumption that the threat of nuclear war will inhibit India from retaliating in a conventional manner can now be consigned to history. India has discarded its policy of strategic restraint and unveiled a new security doctrine in which Pakistan can no longer export terror to India without paying a heavy price for it. It is Pakistan which will now have to decide whether it has the appetite or resources to stand up to the escalation that future terrorist attacks on India will invariably invite. Pakistan has fairly and squarely brought upon itself the predicament that it finds itself in. The country failed to foresee that the impunity it had begun to consider the norm and take for granted would eventually come to a standstill and the retribution that would follow would be severely damaging. For instance, Pakistan is presently on the Financial Action Task Force Grey List on account of the shortcomings in its counter-terrorism financing and anti-money laundering regimes. The organization has repeatedly warned Pakistan of the ramifications of letting terror groups operate in the country and did so most recently in February at an FATF meeting in Paris soon after the Pulwama attack. Pakistan's finance secretary Arif Ahmed Khan has disclosed that the FATF recommendations in strict action against the bank outfits and Pakistan could face economic sanctions if it does not implement those recommendations. FETF officials have specifically mentioned Jaish e Mohammed and Lashkar e Taiba, as well as their renamed successor groups. Therefore, Pakistan needs to demonstrate adequate progress against these groups before the next FATF plenary, which is due in June this year, or else it faces blacklisting and banking isolation, which is something that its fragile and highly vulnerable economy simply cannot afford. Pakistan's Foreign Minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi has disclosed that the government's <coughs> estimation of the damages to the country, even if it simply remains on the grey list, which is present on, could be up to $10 billion per year. The economic consequences of blacklisting or grey listing by FATF becomes more acute for Pakistan when seen in conjunction with the 3rd of April statement of the country's finance minister, Asad Omar, who said that Pakistan's basic debts were so sizable that the country was near bankruptcy. The International Monetary Fund has predicted that the spiraling inflation will reach 14% by the end of this year, 
While economists expect unemployment to surge to 7.5 to 8% by the end of this year. Sandwiched between the world's two giant financial powers, US and China, Pakistan has borrowed heavily from Beijing and also from the Western world. It has taken out billions in Chinese loan and run up a huge Chinese funded master plan to build ports, roads, bridges, and railways. A $62 billion plan called the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, running through the disputed region of Gilgit-Baltistan, part of Jammu and Kashmir, has been celebrated by both countries as a long-term investment that will increase trade. Whereas in essence, Beijing considers these projects as ways to demonstrate its power besides securing allies. Certainly, the Pakistani economy needs to grow beyond rise and textile, which means building new infrastructures. But the question is that in pursuing ambitious projects, China is pushing Pakistan's deficits to unsustainable levels. Debts are rising rapidly while the country's hard currency is running out to pay its bills and as a consequence, Pakistan is left with no choice but to beg for a monetary fund for a multi-billion dollar bailout which will be one of more than a dozen that Pakistan has received since the 1980s. China is seeking new markets for its construction companies and new pathways to ship its goods and that is why it is financing ambitious infrastructure projects across Central and South Asia. In Pakistan, only 1% of the population is registered in the tax system and the government collects just 9% of the country's wealth in taxes, which is the lowest in the world. This is one of the major causes of the Pakistani government being dependent on laws. One could see how low tax realization, endemic corruption and tax evasion, decrease of industrial growth owing to expensive energy resources, the feeding of the Pakistani army, an expenditure of around $9 billion a year for purchase of arms to counter India and support terrorist groups, have altogether dragged Pakistan to the brink of bankruptcy. China claims that its loans do not have the same strings attached as the loans from various international lending agencies. Yet, this is clearly untrue. Much of the profit from new power plants and roads go straight back to Chinese companies. A glaring example in this context is the case of Sri Lanka. When the country could not pay back the money it had borrowed from China, it had to hand over its Hampton Dota seaport for 99 years to China. The Chinese master plan conceives a picture where the majority of Pakistani socio-economic sectors are deeply penetrated by Chinese companies and Chinese culture. <coughs> Therefore, Islamabad puts itself at risk of facing its finances and social structure experiencing a colossal wreck. The combination of high upfront tariffs, interest rates, and surcharges will complicate Pakistan's efforts to repay its loans forcing the state to increase its domestic and export prices, making it difficult to compete with neighboring and other countries which maintain lower prices. The 15-year mega project illuminates how Pakistan voluntarily is becoming progressively subjugated by China and its terms and conditions. Therefore, regardless of the recent 13 bailout package provided by the IMF, the economic future of Pakistan remains grim. Pakistan has rarely in its history been confronted with such wide spectrum of challenges as it faces today as a consequence of its support for terror. It finds itself at a crossroad, crossroad with the options before it quite straightforward. It can comply with the new reality and even at this late stage choose to change course and cease its support for terror. Or alternatively, it can continue to use terrorism as a tool to further its political goals, all the while denying that it is doing so even in the face of irrefutable evidence. Unfortunately, the prognosis for the former world seems not right at all. Therefore, serious danger for the stability of the South Asian region lurks around the corner.